fall of 1983, a group of Cuban-backed communists overthrew the government of the Western Caribbean island of Grenada. Anybody remember that? And if you remember, they installed a dictatorship and they replaced ordinary law with military law. And, and when they did this, it required immediate and total submission to the government. In other words, the people of Grenada instantly lost their freedom and liberty in a second, right? Over 100 people who stood against the overthrow, including 50 children, these communists rounded them up and marched them into the fort in the capital city of St. George. And those 100 people have never been seen or heard from again. Now, this action, if you remember, it caught the attention of our former president, Ronald Reagan. You see, what was happening on the island of Grenada was that there were 600 U.S. medical students who were studying and Ronald Reagan, at this time, he was not about to let happen what happened in Iran years previous, where there was a hostage situation. He was not allow, about to allow U.S. citizens to become hostages of this new communist government. And if we know anything about Ronald Reagan, we know he didn't play, right? So what he did is he quickly deployed an elite military rescue team consisting of Army Rangers, Delta Force, Navy SEALs, and Marines to Granada. And, and the members of this operation, and the operation was codenamed Operation Urgent Fury, they struck in the middle of the night. And they struck hard. And within one day, the island was free again. <laughs> now, the US medical students were safe. And more than that, the people of Grenada learned one of the most important lessons that we could ever learn about freedom, and it's this. Liberty is most precious when it is suddenly taken away from you. Amen? If you've ever been to jail or if you've ever joined the military, you know what it's like to lose your freedom in an instant, right? And at that moment, whether you, you signed up to join the military or what, <laughs> when you realize what you've done, and that now you no longer have your freedom, all of a sudden your freedoms that you took for granted becomes precious to you. And that's what happened to the people of Grenada. And it looks like they learned the lesson because they remain a free democratic nation to this day. But there was a similar overthrow that occurred in the first century church. You see, what happened in the first century church is that there was a certain group of Jewish believers they were frequently called Judaizers, and they launched their own invasion into the Galatian churches. And through legalism, they stole the people's freedom in Christ and put them back under the dictatorship of the law. And what these Judaizers did is they denied Paul's message, the very simple message that salvation and maturity were through grace by simple faith in Christ. That's the gospel that Paul had preached to the Galatians. But these guys came in and they said, unless you're circumcised according to the customs taught by Moses, and unless you do all these laws and all these regulations, you cannot be saved. In order to get the Galatians to, to follow them, these false teachers sunk so low as to attack Paul himself. And they told them that, Paul wasn't even an apostle. These were young believers. And commentator and pastor Max Anders tells us that sadly, many Galatian believers began believing these false teachers. And they submitted to circumcision and other Old Testament laws and even a whole bunch of other laws that aren't even in the Bible that the religious leaders had added to the Old Testament and the reason why they were doing this is they were trying to gain eternal life. And they were trying to mature in Christ. But what they didn't realize is that as they started to do all these regulations, as they started to try and follow all these laws, they went from being free to becoming slaves again. See, tragically, these once free Christ followers had surrendered their freedom and they were back in bondage, this time to the law. But God, everybody say, but God. but God. 
But God was not about to stand for this, okay? And so what he does is, just like uh, using our analogy from Grenada, he tasks his own elite soldier, the Apostle Paul, to do some liberating. And so Paul, deployed by the Holy Spirit, he unleashes his own Operation Urgent Fury. And with the power of a full-scale assault, he demolishes the lies of the legalists with the mighty six-chapter defense of grace that has come down to us, that is known to us as the book of Galatians. This book is one of the most important books in the entire Bible and the most important books within church history. See, in this letter, Paul goes to the very heart of legalism, and he attacks it at its root. And it is believed that this bold letter to the Galatians restored them back to freedom. And one thing is for certain, it saved the early church and many subsequent followers and subsequent generations from this devastating heresy. There's really two major heresies that have been around in the body of Christ since the beginning. One of the heresies is what's called antinomianism. It's you can sin as much as you want as long as you, you know, you're in Christ. It's fine. It doesn't matter how you live. That's one heresy that's been around forever. But the other one is this one, and it's the belief that you can be justified by your works. That if you work hard enough, you can get God to accept you. And this, if you've been around the church for any amount of time, you know that this heresy is still around. And so the book of Galatians has been called, and it truly is, the Magna Carta, which means the charter of freedom of Christianity. God has used this book mightily throughout history, from Martin Luther to John Wesley. Great men of God were stirred, and they were instructed by this book to defend and, and restore one thing, the message of the gospel. Everybody say the gospel. We're going to find out just how precious the gospel is and just how much Satan hates the gospel and just how much he tries to keep people away from the gospel. But Galatians is the solution to all that. Because in it, the gospel restores sinners. It gives us the pathway on how an unholy, sinful human race could be restored to right relationship with God, a holy God. It's a book of freedom. Everybody say freedom. freedom. So that's where we're going tonight in this series. We're going to dig into this, this book. And, and by the grace of God, I'm believing that by the time that we're finished, everyone in here that, that goes through this, we're going to walk out of this more free in Christ than we ever have been before. So if you're battling, even if you're battling with things like addictions or if you're battling with things like legalism or if you just feel like you don't measure up and you feel like no matter what you do, God's not happy with you. If you battle with any of those things, this book is called The Bondage Breaker. And it is going to break chains as we see the way the Holy Spirit uses this apostle to share these truths. So if you're ready for some freedom, say amen. amen. All right. Now, that's kind of the prelude. Now, the way that we're going to work is that we're going to take one chapter per session. All right? There are six chapters in the book of Galatians, so we should finish in six sessions. Now, notice I said the word should, right? <laughs> because, as always, I reserve the right to extend the series if need be, right? But tonight, we're going to go through chapter one. And um, as we get going, I just want to give you some background some basics on the background, because what we're about to witness is the first recorded battle for the gospel, battle for the gospel of Christ. The gospel, we're going to find out, is divine in its origin and nature. The gospel is the very power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, and it is the only way to be in right standing with God. And therefore, and this is already the key takeaway from tonight, no person has the right to mess with its content. But that's exactly what was going on. That's exactly what was happening 
in the Galatian church. Now, who, who, who are the Galatians? What is this Galatian church we're talking about? Well, in the book of Acts, chapters 13 and 14, we read, if you remember, when Paul got saved, God sent him aside, him and Barnabas, and they went out and they went through the ancient Roman world. Mainly, they started off in the area of Turkey, and they started preaching the gospel. And so in the book of Acts, chapter 13 and 14, we read about Paul's ministry to the Roman province of Galatia. Now, that term Galatia, if you pay attention to it, the word Gaul is in there because the Galatians are just the descendants of the tribes of the, of the Gaulish people who were started off in Western Europe. And then they migrated and they settled there in no northern and central Turkey. And the area where Paul and Barnabas ministered was, and I think, we, yeah, we have a picture of it there. The area where Paul and Barnabas ministered they were in the central part. If you look at the central part of Turkey down there, that's where they preached. We're talking about Antioch of Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra. These are some of the first Gentiles that have ever heard the gospel of Christ. Up until that time, Gentiles were not allowed to be part of the church. But God knocked down those walls. And these Gentiles were some of the first to, to hear the good news. And if you remember, just if you've read the book of Acts, you remember a lot of things that went on there. One of the interesting stories was Paul, he goes into Lystra with Barnabas, and there's a guy there that's been crippled from birth, right? And God heals him miraculously through the apostle Paul, okay? So the whole crowd has seen this guy. He's been crippled from birth, and now Paul lays in, he tells him to get up. He gets up, and he's now healed. And the crowd loses their mind. And so the, the crowd decides that Paul and Barnabas were the Greek gods Zeus and Hermes that had come down to earth to visit them. So, so here Paul and Barnabas, they're about to preach the gospel, and they come in. Here comes the priest of Zeus with a cow, and he's getting ready to, with oxen, he's about to sacrifice to the apostle Paul and Barnabas. And they lose their minds. It's like, no. Do not worship us, right? And they're like, okay, they really wanted to, right? So they finally convinced them to not worship them. But then eventually, just a little while later, some Jewish people who were jealous of the way that the gospel was spreading turned the crowd against Paul and Barnabas. And they ended up stoning Paul and leaving him for dead. But God wasn't done with him. Amen. That's a takeaway right there. If you're not dead yet, God isn't done with you. Amen. <laughs> Paul, Paul was not done yet. So he, it says that he got up and just walked right back into the city. But, but in that little story, we learned something about the Galatians. Okay. And, and what we learned about the Galatians is that they had a reputation for being those who could be easily swayed, right? One moment they're trying to worship Paul and Barnabas as Zeus and Hermes, and the next moment they're trying to stone him to death. That's also an illustration of ministry as well, by the way, right? But the bottom line is that many there had responded to the message, and they trusted Christ as Savior. And so Paul and Barnabas went through these cities. It's kind of like a blitzkrieg. They hit city after city after city. They get to this place called Derby. They end up preaching the gospel there. And then they retrace their steps back to the cities that they went through in Galatia. And this is important right here. They strengthened and they encouraged the new believers. And then they appointed elders in each church. So they planted the churches, and they went back through, and then they established the churches. So, so when Paul leaves Galatia and moves on to his next mission field, he feels pretty good about the Galatians, okay? They're in pretty good shape. They were now established as churches, and, and now they should be in position to start growing and becoming what God had called them to be. But almost as soon as Paul and Barnabas leaves, it's like he walks out the front door and the devil walks in the back door. That's another illustration for us as well. God, we have to be on our guard 
or when, when God is doing something in our lives because it sometimes seems that you could be on the mountaintop one day and then be down in the pit the next. Amen? And so that's what happens here. Some false teachers known as Judaizers, they come in right behind Paul and they undo everything that Paul did. They tell the people Paul isn't really an apostle. And then they tell the people that the message he preached really wasn't the way of salvation. They explain that, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. You see, they were Jewish legalists, Jewish Christian legalists. They had the title of followers of Christ. That's important. And they explained that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. However, if you want to be saved, you've got to believe in Jesus as the Messiah and and as soon as you hear the word end, when somebody tells you the gospel, it's time to turn the other way. Amen? And flee. Because what you're having right there is a false gospel that's being preached. And they told them, okay, that's good, that's good, you believe in the Messiah, that's good. Paul, he's, he's messed up, he's not an apostle, but at least he told you about Jesus, you know. And, and, and so, now here's the deal. Sit down, let me enlighten you. You need to get circumcised. You need to start observing all the fast days. You need to wash your hands up to your elbow. And they began to give them all these codes, hundreds and hundreds of, of complex codes that Judaism had become. And because the Galatians were young in their faith, that's why it's so important for us to be in the Word, amen? To get rooted and grounded. Because they were young in their faith and because they had a propensity to be easily swayed, they bought it hook, line, and sinker. And so there's just about a mass defection going on in the church at Galatia. They abandon the simplicity of salvation through faith in Jesus and growth in their relationship with him through the Holy Spirit. And they go, unbeknownst to them, and that's how it happens, unbeknownst, they go instantly from freedom to slavery. But the good news is this. This man of God, Paul, gets the word. And if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, if there's one thing we know about him is that he's a passionate guy. Amen? And when he hears about this, he gets angry. And you can learn a lot about a person by what gets them angry. Amen? If you really want to know what a person is about, find out what gets them upset, what breaks their heart, what, what, what really drives them. And Paul is angry because he loves these people. And he is ticked because somebody would come in and undo the work of grace that God was doing there. And so that's the backdrop. That's what's going on when Paul sits down with his quill and his parchment, right? And he gets ready to write this letter. And so the way that we're going to do this, we're going to look at chapter 1 tonight. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to outline this in a way that's easy to remember. We're going to break it down into three sections. The greeting, the gospel, and the apostle. Everybody say the greeting, the, greeting. the gospel, the gospel. And, the and the apostle. That's what chapter 1 is going to be all about. So the greeting is going to cover verses 1 through 5. And in Paul's greeting to the Galatians, we're going to notice something interesting right off the bat. We're going to notice something's wrong. You see, if you read Paul's other letters, when he writes a greeting, there's, he's like bubbling over with love and affection for the people he's writing to. Not in the book of Galatians. He is pretty upset, and he's serious right from the get-go. He's on a mission, and he is filled with righteous indignation. Translation, he's ticked. Right? That's it. And, and so the greeting is going to be very instructive to us. And then in verses 6 through 10, we're going to cover the gospel. And more specifically, we're going to cover what's called the exclusivity of the gospel. And in some of the strongest language that we're going to read anywhere in the Bible, we're going to discover this one thing. God himself does not take kindly to those who try to change his gospel to fit their goals. This is so important for us in this age. Amen? 
We're living in an unprecedented time where people are taking the gospel and they're making it say what they want it to say so that they can build their platform and raise followers up for themselves. And so what we're going to learn is that is a no-no. God does not take kindly to this. And then we're going to finish out the chapter in verses 1124 where the apostle will begin his defense. And he's going to lay out one of the most brilliant defenses of both the gospel and his apostleship. See, the Judaizers wanted to get the people away from Paul's message so bad, but they were loyal to Paul. So the only way they could get the Galatians away from the gospel was to destroy Paul's credibility. We see this today, too, if you watch politics at all. If there ever somebody raises up that has a voice that resonates with people, they don't usually go after so much the policies, they go after the person, right? And they start saying how bad that person is. And it happens on both sides. It's epidemic. That's exactly what the Judaizers do to Paul. They do a hit job on him, okay? And they take out his credibility. They say things like, well, you know, he wasn't one of the original apostles. Right? And you know what? Don't you remember? He was the one that was destroying the church. He's an undercover agent. And he's going to throw you all in jail. That's his goal. Right? So they attack his credibility. But Paul is going to start taking care of that when we go through verses 11 through 24. And he's going to destroy their attacks with facts and logic. And it's really cool. So everybody say the greeting, the, greeting. the, gospel, the gospel, and the apostle. the apostle. All right, let's start with the greeting, verses 1 through 5. Go ahead now and turn in your Bibles to the book of Galatians. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Paul sits down now. He has somebody he's dictating this to, more than likely. But it reads, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. So as we said earlier, Paul's greeting, it's not his typical greeting. He's not doing his normal, overflowing, bubbling, affectionate self. He's direct. He's to the point. But more than that, even in this greeting, he starts his counterattack against the Judaizers. Even in this greeting, he starts to share the truth of the gospel, and he starts to defend his apostleship. Notice right now the points that Paul just made and what we read about his apostleship in the gospel itself. First, Paul explains his apostleship was by divine call. It did not come to him through ordination by a denomination or an organization or an individual. In other words, he said, you know what? Nobody laid hands on me and said, you are now a minister of the gospel. God himself laid hands on me and said, you are a minister of my gospel. He starts off, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now, where, did, where was Paul commissioned by God? Scripture confirms it in Acts chapter 9 and Acts 26 with direct quotes from Jesus himself commission, commissioning Paul. So we know that Paul, from hindsight, we know because we have the word of God, that Paul is most definitely an apostle. But let's go ahead and look at the book of Acts chapter 26, verses 15 through 18. This is Paul talking about his conversion. And he, he goes back to the time when he met Jesus on the Damascus Road. He was going to persecute the church, and Jesus knocks him off his high horse, right? And he's blinded by the light of the glory of Jesus. And he hears the voice of Jesus directly from Jesus' lips to his ears. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
And then we'll pick it up right there. Verse 15. And Paul says, And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Could you imagine? But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So right there, Jesus tells Paul, you are going to be my minister. And then in that very same sentence, he gives Paul the gospel, right? You're going to turn people from darkness to light. They're going to get forgiveness of their sins. They're going to receive an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by their faith in me. Jesus appointed Paul an apostle. So the Judaizers, the Judaizers, and this is something we need to see, is that their attack on Paul's apostleship was an attack on the very word of God itself. Paul is saying, I didn't promote myself. The apostles didn't promote me. The believers at Damascus didn't promote me. Jesus called me. So by you attacking me, you're attacking his word. Then he says, with all the brethren, I got to stop there for a second. You are who God says you are. Amen? It doesn't matter what man says about you. The word of God says that if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus, you are a born again creation. You are the head. You are not the tail. You are going forward. You are not going backward. You are above. You are no longer beneath. Amen? Then Paul goes on and he says, with all the brethren with me. In other words, my apostleship has the backing of established followers of Christ. So not only am I ordained by God, but God's followers that are already established already acknowledge me as an apostle. He's starting to lay his foundation. Now he says grace and peace. Grace and peace is the traditional greeting in, in, in the ancient world. Grace had to do with the Greek Greeting and peace had to do with shalom, the, the Jewish greeting. But it's something important that Paul is saying here. And this is something that if you're a legalist, if you're stuck in legalism, this is for you as well. He says grace and peace. But if you're in legalism, you know nothing about grace and peace. Amen? Because here's the deal. You can never work hard enough to be accepted so you can never have peace. Amen? Paul is so brilliant that he's countering the falsehood of the Judaizers in every single word he's writing. He goes on now to continue declaring gospel truths. He says, Jesus gave himself for our sins to rescue us. How many know Jesus is a rescuer? I don't care where you're at right now. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care how bad you're situation is based on the authority of God's word and his character we have the right to call on him as our rescuer amen and I just want to encourage you with that right now and, and he says Jesus gave himself for our sins to rescue us and and the point Paul's making is we can't rescue ourselves amen as a matter of fact if you got a clean slate today like you never sinned at all up until this very moment right now and you got a clean slate, and you did good works every waking hour of the remainder of your life, they could never, those good works could still never rescue you because we can do nothing to cleanse ourselves from our sins. Amen? That's so important. Legalists, Judaizers believe that you can do something that will make you acceptable to God. And Paul is saying right here, no way. So this is a very cool greeting, right? Very cool, very, I'm not giving of myself completely to you right now because we have to talk, right? But if the Galatians are concerned about the coolness of Paul toward them, 
They don't have to worry because it's about to get hot right here, okay? Paul is not going to mince any words now as he gets right down to business, verses 6 through 10. He says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort, and that word distort means pervert, who want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be scolded hard. He is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. That's strong, isn't it? That's some strong words. I have a cousin in New York who say that. That's pretty harsh, Chris, right? But as we get ready to break this down, there are three key words that we want to make sure we understand so we can unlock the weightiness of what's going on here. The first word is deserting. The reference here is like a military desertion. Deserters from an army, they destroy the morale of the army and they destroy and break down the readiness of that unit. The more people that desert from an army, the less able it is to function, to fight. Paul uses this term because he needs them to understand that by listening and accepting to a false gospel, they were deserting Jesus. Jesus is the captain of hosts. He's the Lord of hosts, right? And he's, he's our commanding officer. And, and they were deserting his army to the detriment of their spiritual life. The second word, the key word, is gospel. This is so, so important. As you go through the Bible, and especially the New Testament, there are several different mentions of the word gospel. And in a couple different scenarios, it means different things. It always means good news. But when Paul uses the word gospel, it means one thing. This is, this is a, a, a cheat sheet here. If you're reading a letter from the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul references the gospel, he always means the plan of salvation. The gospel that Paul is talking about when he says the gospel, the good news, it details how mankind can experience right standing and right relationship with God. God has given mankind books like Galatians and Romans so that we can understand the gospel. And it is his method. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. It is God's method that he has made available for every human being on the face of planet Earth to receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life. How many would agree that's, that's an important message? And now the third word is accursed. And here's the big one. Accursed. This in the Greek word is the word anathema. Everybody say anathema. anathema. This word means doomed to destruction. It means eternally condemned. And to say it in the clearest way possible, accursed means damned to hell. So that is strong. What's going on here, though? Paul is saying, I don't care who it is. Listen to me. If it's a person, if it's an angel, even if it's me, if anybody tampers with the message I gave you concerning how to get your sins forgiven and get right with God, let that person be damned to hell, myself included. Why is Paul being so harsh? Because he received the gospel directly from Jesus himself. To give you the picture, 
the gospel went from Jesus' lips to Paul's ears. So Paul understands that this is the only message available that will rescue people from hell. And so any person who was teaching, just follow the logic here, any person who would teach anything else would be leading people straight to the caverns of hell. And Paul condemns that in the strongest terms possible. I said earlier, you could tell a lot about a person by finding out what gets them angry, right? People going to hell should make us angry. It should break our hearts. People leading other people there with false teaching should get to us. Paul is brokenhearted over what is happening here, and it shows in this passionate declaration. Now notice he says that they're deserting for another gospel, which is really not another. Paul knows there's only one gospel, and any distortion of it makes it a non-gospel. So let me do an illustration here, okay? This right here, this water, it's called Fiji water, okay? And I did some research on this. This is what the people who distribute this water say about it. This water begins as clouds, okay? <laughs> High above the island country of Fiji, over 1,600 miles from the nearest continent, the clouds produce tropical rainfalls that are purified by equatorial trade winds. The rain then falls in a pristine rainforest that's surrounded by ancient dormant volcanoes. And as this water is absorbed into the ground, it is slowly filtered by volcanic rock. And as it does, it gathers minerals and electrolytes that create its soft, smooth taste. It then collects in a natural artesian aquifer, underground aquifer, protected and preserved from external elements until you unscrew the cap. <laughs> and this is Earth's finest water, bottled at the source and untouched by man. Anybody thirsty after listening to that, right? That's enough to make you thirsty. But now, let me ask you a question. What if I took a drop, just a drop, of lethal, clear, odorless poison, and I took that eyedropper, and I dropped that drop in the, into this water, this clear, greatest water in, in, in all the world, and I shook it up, and then I drank it. <laughs> I'd be dead, right? But here's the thing. It still looks like water. It still tastes like water. But if you drank it, it would kill you. That's what Paul is saying here. These Judaizers are presenting something that looks life-giving, but it's really life-killing. And this is why we need to know the gospel inside and out. Amen? So that we can share it as clearly as well as protect ourselves from falling into the traps that are out there. Some serious stuff here. So we've covered now the greeting and the gospel, and now we're going to very quickly go through verses 11 through 24. We tell this part the apostle because it's here that the apostle Paul begins his counter-argument. So let's read verses 11 and 12 first. It reads, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. But I received it through a revelation. Everybody say revelation. revelation. I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul is now about to give him the details about how he received the gospel. Before he goes into the what, he wants to talk about the how. And the main point that he's going to make in several different ways is that he did not receive this gospel from anybody. He didn't get it from the disciples at Damascus. He didn't get it from Peter. He didn't get it from John. He got it from Jesus himself. And he uses the words, I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. That word revelation is the exact same word we use in the book of Revelation. 
the revelation of Jesus Christ, apocalypsis. And what it means is it's the unveiling of something that was previously hidden but has now been made known. It's kind of like if I was a, a sculptor or an artist, and I'm not, so this would be ugly. But if I had a sculptor, if I had a sculpture that I had created, and I put a big sheet over it, and you looked at the sheet, and you might be able to see kind of like some of the shape of it, but you wouldn't know what I had here until I took the sheet and uncovered it, right? I unveiled it. That's what that term apocalypsis means. It's the unveiling. That's what the gospel was. It was veiled. It was hidden. And, and Jesus unveiled it to, to Peter and the apostles. But here separately, totally by himself, away from all the apostles, he unveils it. He reveals it to the apostle Paul. Now, the way that he's going to build his defense, he's going to talk about his life pre-conversion, conversion, and post-conversion. So verses 13 and 14, he says, For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism. Paul was a hardcore Jew. Paul was a hardcore legalist before he got saved. And not only that, he was a persecutor of the church. He said, How I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. When the Bible describes the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, when he's Saul and he's still persecuting the church, he said, it says of Paul that he was ravaging the church of God like a wild beast. That's the imagery used of Paul before he encounters Jesus. So he says, you know my story. He said, I was trying to destroy the church. I was advancing in Judaism. I was on the fast track to success. He says, though, now, verses 15 through 24. But when God, see, God intervened in Paul's life. Aren't you glad that God intervened in our lives, right? But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. I didn't talk to anybody. I talked to Jesus. He said, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. So Paul's on the road to Damascus. He, he has this amazing conversion experience with, with Jesus. He sees the resurrected, glorified Christ. Jesus commissions him, sends him out. He goes and he waits, and Ananias comes, lays hands on him because he's blind, and the, the, it, something like scales fall from his eyes. Now he can see, and now the Apostle Paul, if you remember, his entire inner man was totally bent on Judaism, and now he knows that he was a murderer. And he was persecuting the very one who he thought he was serving. And so now he has this huge turnaround. And so now he gets away from everybody and he gets with the Lord. There's some wisdom in that. You're going through something, sometimes it's time to take your Bible and get away from people. Amen? Because some people are going to, maybe well-meaning or not, they're not going to give us the godly counsel that we need. But Paul goes and he gets away and he spends three years receiving revelation from Jesus. It goes on to say, Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But only they kept hearing. He who persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. So Paul gets saved. He starts preaching Jesus. He starts getting more revelation, and God begins to raise him up, and he becomes more and more uh, uh, influential. And he goes, he's there in Damascus. Then he goes back to his hometown. He's from Tarsus, this area of Cilicia. Tarsus is, is a city there. And he's working there, but he's not sure what's next for him. And then Barnabas comes from Syria, from Antioch. Barnabas, it says, was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and faith. Everybody was scared of Paul. People didn't want to come near Paul, right? They were like, this guy, man, it'd be like if Osama bin Laden would come into a church and want to preach the gospel, right? There'd be people that would be, this guy's a terrorist. There's no way we're letting him in here, right? And so, but Barnabas sees what God is doing in his life, and he brings him to Syria. And then Paul is used by God to raise up and establish that church there. 
But the reason why Paul is, is taking us on this journey, and, and next week when we go into chapter 2, he's going to continue uh, talking about his, his journeys, is he's taking us somewhere with it. But again, the main point he's making now, and he's just laying a foundation, he's claiming, he's making the bodacious claim that he didn't get the message from man, but from God. Now, right now, he's making the claim, but when we end up, when we finish chapter one, he's just making the claim. The next time we get together, he's going to prove it to them. So that wraps up our analysis of chapter one. But what I want to do now is I want to close with some application. What does this mean to us, what we just read tonight? And how can we apply it to our lives? Have you heard about the story about the man who lost his keys? He's searching for them, right? He's searching for his keys. He's out in front of his house, underneath the street light, and his neighbor, who's his friend, sees him looking for his keys. So he comes out, and he goes, what's going on? He's like, well, I lost my keys. He said, all right, let me help you. So he spends a couple minutes there. They're looking. They're not finding it anywhere. So he looks at him, and he says, where do you think you lost your keys at? And he said, in my backyard. He said, in your backyard? Why are we out here in your front looking for him here? And he said, well, the light's better out here. <laughs> Funny story, but sadly today, many people are also looking in the wrong place for the key that unlocks salvation. Amen? Amen. They're looking for the key that unlocks a relationship with God. And even churchgoers aren't applying the key because the key is grace. Amen? And there are a lot of churchgoers who are not using the key of grace to unlock the salvation and grow in their relationship with God. Christian author and marketing expert George Barna, he writes... He was doing studies on this, and he writes, Undoubtedly, one of the rudest awakenings I have ever received in my efforts to help churches grow was the discovery born out of research a few years ago that half of all adults who attend Protestant churches on a typical Sunday morning are not Christian. For years, I had been lulled into the comforting but erroneous notion that every Sunday morning I was singing praises to God with the convinced. Little did I realize that a huge portion of those in churches across the land, yes, even those sitting in my pew in my Sunday school class, were non-believers. How tragic would that be? To go to church and think that you're a Christian and never realize that you're saved by grace through faith in Christ and you're trying to work and earn it. Additionally, Barna's detailed research tells us that over 80 million people in America are unchurched. That was several years ago. There's more now. He estimates that of the 2.2 million people who die each year in America, that more than 1 million of those people will go to hell. So the main takeaway tonight is this. The gospel is a big deal because it is the only way possible for a sinful human being to be able to come into right relationship with a holy God and have their sins forgiven and inherit eternal life. And the gospel in its essence is this. For God so loved the world, for God so loved you and me, that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for the sins of the world. And whoever, everybody say whoever, yes. doesn't matter if you're black, white, Puerto Rican, young, old, Asian, whoever believes in him, believes that he lived a sinless and spotless life and then gave himself on the cross as a propitiation as a sacrifice for mankind but he didn't stay dead but he was raised again on the third day 
Whoever puts their full trust, and this is something right here, the huge takeaway that we need to seal and cement and get once and for all, even those of us who know this already, we need to cement this in. Whoever puts their full trust in him and the work he did on the cross done on their behalf and not trust any other thing than that for eternal life. That person shall not perish, but have eternal life. If you believe it, say amen. amen. We need to make sure we understand that, and we need to make sure we spread that message. Amen? And that tells you, that gives us a picture of what's going on in our world. We see really what the enemy is up to. He's throwing confusion on the simple gospel. But thankfully, we have this message, and we have the power of God, and we can get the word out. Amen? Let's pray.